Howdy folks, welcome back to Boondockery. My past couple of videos were focused on how to keep you dry in wet weather. Today's video will be focusing on how to keep your kit dry and a couple tricks I've learned over the years on how to set your camp up in the rain. We're going to take a couple minutes to focus on packs. Virtually every single backpack out there has some degree of waterproofing or DWR water repellency. Remember, DWR is durable water repellent, and that is some type of a chemical treatment that's coated to the surface or the interior of the fabrics used to make backpacks. And that will offer some added degree of waterproofing or water repellency. Take that into account with the type of fabrics being used, the density of weave of the fabrics, and you will soon find out just how waterproof it is. There are a couple different ways that you can determine the waterproofing or the water repellency of your backpack. One of which is to load her up and go camping sometime when you know it's going to rain. If your stuff's wet on the inside, you'll know that it's not waterproof or water repellent, but you're also going to have one wet weekend. The other way of determining whether or not your backpack has any degree of waterproofing or water repellency is to do a simple backyard test. Well folks, I call this simple backyard test the hose test. Because all you need is your backyard and a garden hose with a decent spray nozzle on it that can, uh, you know, preferably have multiple degrees of different types of sprays from a very light to a very, you know, forceful very intense spray. What you do is you load up your backpack with sheets, towels, things that are sort of bulky uh, when they're put in there loose, but something that you're going to be able to determine whether or not it's wet very quickly and very easily, and also something that you can put in the dryer and dry, and it's none the worse for wear. You don't have to do any special laundering or anything like that. Now, if you have a pack like this, there's no external pockets, you're just gonna go ahead and fill the interior with it. You can put spacer things in there too, like if you happen to have some of those packing bubbles or something like that, you can put those in the middle, but make certain that you have some type of fabric, like uh, sheets, uh, towels, things like that, all around it to any of the area where it's gonna to be touching the inside surface. Now, when you have a backpack with pockets or pouches on the exterior, you're going to want to put towels and maybe uh, pillowcases, things like that. And here you can use t-shirts, but really you want something that's going to be fairly decently sized so you're not putting a hundred different items in there. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to set these up in the backyard, all loaded up, and you cinch it down exactly the way you would when you're carrying it, when you're going out camping, when you're going out uh, backpacking, wild camping, what have you, you're going to set it up exactly like that. And then if you have a spray nozzle that has multiple settings, go ahead and set it on the lightest setting and simply walk around it and spray the pack for about five to 10 minutes. Let some of that rain run off. And especially if it's a good sunny day, the sun will help you out by drying up a little bit of the surface. The one thing it will not do is to dry the interior if by any chance any water got in. So once you know you have a fairly decently dry exterior, open it up and very carefully push back the fabric, feel around in there, pull some of it out to see if it got wet. If it did, well, that lets you know that you need to do something about that. Now, if by any chance you're in a hurry and you haven't got time for an all day ordeal, which if you do it leisurely and you take your time and you go from the lightest setting to the most uh, fierce setting with your hose, it, it could take a day. However, if you're already doing backyard chores anyway, from this to that to the other place, you know, peri periodically you come back and you check it and you go about your day. And it's, it's, it's an easy thing to do when you're already busy doing chores outside. It's not, not that big of an ordeal to do. 
Now, if by any chance you don't have time for that, go ahead and go for the Gusto Baby. You hose that booger down with the strongest setting. Three to five minutes, let her have it, let her rip. And then go and check it out the way I described before. Again, if any of the contents are wet, or even damp for that matter, that's going to give you a clue that you need to do something about it in order to make certain that your actual bushcraft, you know, wild camping kit stays dry. Now, chances are the main compartment of your pack is probably going to provide the greatest amount of waterproofing or water repellency. That being said, there are a lot of exterior storage locations on backpacks that will either uh, feature flaps or zippers or some type of closure techniques that may fail as far as water repellency and waterproofing goes. Like this old Alice pack, one of its uh, areas that it will leak is right back here on the back part of the flap. Even though the flap is designed to pull down and you can tighten that up, water can still drip down and through there. Another thing, the old Alice's, they did have some degree of uh, weather treatment, but it wasn't the greatest. Now, if you have a situation like this old Alice um, pocket, what you're going to need to do is, yes, you could treat it with a DWR, durable water repellent treatment, but the easiest thing to do with something like this is whatever the contents are, just simply put it in a waterproof bag or a waterproof container, and tuck it back in there, and just let <laughs> this old Alice uh, uh, pack pocket just sort of carry the stuff around, use something else to keep it dry. Now, a lot of backpacks today have zippers all over them. And uh, a lot of them, mm, not the highest quality. Uh, a lot of uh, backpack companies out there, they want to sell you stuff as cheaply as they can to get you to buy it. So if they're selling it to you as cheaply as they possibly can, so you will buy it, chances are they're going to be skimping on certain parts like the zippers. Mystery Ranch, if you've seen their prices, you know that's not their cup of tea. They don't do that kind of stuff. They give you good quality stuff, I'm telling you right now, okay? Now, I want to give you a closer look at this. This is an example of one of Mystery Ranch's waterproof zips. This thing is absolutely fantastic. Let's take a look at that. Let's see if we can zip it here. Now, it'll zip, unzip, never get snagged, does a fantastic job, but the way that this, I don't even know what material that is. Whatever type of material that is, does an absolutely fantastic job at keeping water out of that pocket or pouch that happens to be on your pack. So if you have um, a zipper, again, if it's not designed like this, then just go ahead and put whatever you normally carry in that pocket or pouch in some type of a waterproof bag or container. And <laughs> believe me, you won't regret it. Now, the designers of the Alice Pack knew before they issued it out what the drawbacks were for it. And they also knew the environments on which the United States soldiers were going to be using it. And knowing that it was going to be used extensively in rainforest type areas, they made it of nylon, not canvas. It won't rot. The other thing is underneath of this, they have drain hole grommets in the bottom of the main compartment and under each one of the external pockets. And um, is that way, water does get in it, it won't be standing, and will allow any of the drainage to occur, eh, minimizing the amount of water that's going to be getting to your kit. Again, pouches and pockets like this, waterproof bag or container. Now, in the event that the main compartment 
wasn't as uh, water repellent as what you thought it was but the fabric is, is still good quality fabric there's no holes there's no rips there's no tears there's no real reason why water should be getting in there other than the fact that it's just leaking through the fabric that's a golden opportunity to utilize a DWR treatment now for those of you that have seen my uh, past couple of videos that I've done on uh, wet weather gear and especially uh, weather treating my anorak you will have seen exactly how I apply DWR or water durable water repellent materials to make my uh, gear water resistant or waterproof now I don't want to beat a dead horse <laughs> for you folks who have already seen it especially because that goes directly against YouTube's guidelines and standards I get in a lot of trouble if I beat a dead horse on here so for those of you that have not yet seen them, I recommend seeing it because it shows the whole process on how to apply those. But in short, you have a couple different variations that you can use. There are many, many, many types out there. Uh, these um, products are made by Kiwi. They're silicone based. One is a waterproofing, which is a higher degree of silicone in it. And after uh, multiple coats, it will waterproof fabric like boots, things like that, does a phenomenal job if you want water to never be able to uh, penetrate the fabric that you spray it on. The other material is also made by Kiwi. It has a lower amount of silicone in it and a couple other materials in order to allow this material to be water resistant and yet also breathable on fabrics like Gore-Tex. You know, just go ahead and watch the video so you can see how to apply it. Now, you have some older surplus packs like this old Alice pack and the top flap is rubber coated and that's rubber coated and rubber coating is 100% waterproof it's non uh, porous it's non permeable and does a great job but you know after a little while that stuff starts to dry rot and deteriorate and there'll be big splotches in here and so what you have left is just a thin layer of, of a nylon material and it's not in any way shape or form even water repellent so what you can do to treat areas like this is something like flex seal lay it out flat uh, follow directions spray it on a thin coat allow it to completely dry then reapply until it gets to the degree of thickness that you desire it takes about 24 hours after the final coat is put on for it to cure and after that it should last a very long time and still stay very pliable and 100% waterproof. I've heard a lot of folks talk about um, seam sealing uh, their packs. Now uh, today uh, you have companies like uh, Mystery Ranch that the interior of their packs all of the seams have a taping on them, a nylon taping, so there is no raw seams. However, there's a lot of packs out there, especially older packs, that do have raw seams. Now, what happens when you have a raw seam that doesn't have the, the seam uh, tape on it or a sealing tape is that when the stitching, the, the thread goes through, holding those pieces of fabric together, it creates little holes because that, that thread is very tight and it will pull those little holes open and it will allow water to come through those little holes. So the traditional way of sealing seams, like on tents, I'm certain a lot of you have uh, sealed a lot of the seams on your flies, uh, tarps and tents, because a lot of the companies out there will actually include a tube of seam sealer and will recommend that you seal the seams before you actually use it. Now this stuff, you can get a lot of different places. Any really good sporting school, uh, good store, like REI, places like that, they sell it. But when you really look at the amount of ounces you get for that, it's pretty expensive. There are a couple um, inexpensive alternatives to that that uh, you get a lot more for your money and it actually winds up going on uh, just, just as easily. Um, because of the, the nozzle that's on it and um, there, there are two one of which is fabric glue you can get a craft section at places like um, you know, Hobby Lobby uh, even the, the uh, craft section at um, Walmart uh, Joanne Fabrics 
all those types of places will sell it. Now, one of which is clear to begin with, and you simply apply it exactly the way you would a traditional seam sealer. The other it comes out white, but will eventually dry clear. And you apply it exactly the same way you do a traditional uh, seam sealer. It's flexible, it's waterproof, and it's a lot cheaper. You get a whole lot more for your money than you do with a traditional seam sealer. Now, the other route is probably the least expensive, but it's also probably the most challenging to apply. You would definitely need help uh, from someone to make certain that they're holding the pack flat for you so you can access the seam very easily. And that is going to your hardware store and getting a tube of 100% silicone caulking. It goes on uh, in the same fashion, except it's big. It's big. You gotta use a gun to shoot it in there. Big gun. So it's it's unwieldy. And you have to cut a little teeny tiny, itsy bitsy teeny weeny hole in the very tip of it. So you're not getting this big glob of stuff coming out all at once. So there's a few challenges involved in it. But if you really want to save money and have a whole lot of stuff, like if you have a bunch of stuff you want to uh, seal the seams on, yeah, that would be the cheapest route to go. And once you get it down, the technique, with a little bit of help from a friend, I mean, you can do it lickety split. Very long sections, very quick. And with any of the seam sealing materials that you use, you can use a popsicle stick, something like that. If you have a big glob that, you know, you don't really want a big glob on there, you can use a popsicle stick to smooth that out and redirect it just in case you're a little shaky with your application. And you can put it right back to where you need to. With all of these materials, they generally cure within 24 hours and will offer a 100% waterproof seal. Now that you know the extent to which your pack is waterproof or water resistant or what you need to make it so, let's talk about a few other ways to keep the contents of your pack dry. Now I personally absolutely love sub-compartmentalizing all of my kit within my pack. This is a habit I've gotten into since way back. and. Um, what I have before me is a plethora of waterproof containers that you too can subcompartmentalize your belongings in your pack and keep them waterproof. Let's take a closer look at these items, shall we? Now before we get too far into this, I want to go ahead and point one thing out waterproof boxes. I personally do not like these for backpacking, wild camping, or anything else like that. Um, they take up way too much space, they make noise, and um, they're just not really conducive to backpacking. I know a lot of um, folks use them and they are waterproof, but for as far as I'm concerned, for my purposes, they just simply don't fit uh, my needs when I'm in the woods. Something like this is absolutely fantastic and I use these when I go kayaking, anytime to where you're gonna be doing any type of boating. Something like this is fantastic because not only is it waterproof, it also floats. Now that that's out of the way, a lot of folks really like to waterproof the interior of their pack simply by putting a great big old waterproof bag on the inside of your backpack. And if that, that's the way you want to, want to roll with things, there's pluses and minuses to that. Yes, it keeps all the contents um, dry to, you know, some to some degree, some perfectly dry. However, if you need to access the interior of your pack and it's raining while you're doing it, then all the water is going down inside that waterproof pack, getting all your stuff wet. That's no good. It's no good. You don't want that, okay? So you, you can very easily, I mean, use a bend liner, and I'll show you a little trick of that here in just a minute. But a standard 55-gallon uh, bend liner, cut to the size that you need. I'll show you a trick with this in just a second. This works okay. It's okay. Uh, it is somewhat fragile compared to other types. This bag 
is exactly like the waterproof um, backpack liner that I used in the Army. And I would uh, slide this down inside my rucksack and I would put things in it. However, when I was in the Army, uh, I learned the hard way and I still subcompartmentalized things that needed to stay dry inside this as well as the outside pockets of my rucksack to keep them dry. This particular one is rubberized on the interior and this is used, believe it or not, but is an absolutely phenomenal shape. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic shape. And the way it closes, you roll the ends around and simply tie it off. On the front, there are small eyelets so that you can use those to cinch it all up to where you have a nice pucker in the top. But the one thing bad about a pucker is water will set in it. So when you open it up, the water goes inside. She's not so good, okay? Now, the last one, and um, there's a lot of uh, companies out there that make these. These are very heavy duty, rubberized um, dry bags. They are dry. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic. I've used this for a few years now. I take it uh, kayaking with me. This is my primary pack because this particular bag is also a backpack. It has shoulder straps with regular adjustments, a uh, breast strap to sit that across your chest, load adjustment straps, and a waist belt. All of these items can be removed and so you would have just a waterproof bag now if you're a big fan of the one great big old bag inside your backpack this right here would probably be the type of bag that would give you the most amount of waterproofing and this particular one has a roll top closure so you roll that in on itself buckle it up and keep that water out. This is an absolutely fantastic system. As rudimentary as may appear, this is very effective. Again, uh, I'm not a huge fan of um, the great big old bag uh, inside your, your backpack. I think you lose a lot of space inside your backpack when you use a heavy bag like this. But if, if that's, that's what you like to do, by all means, do it. But you would probably want to have something, you know, fairly heavy duty uh, to keep your items dry. Now, if uh, you're a fan of the, the bag in your, your main compartment, uh, bin liners are, are super cheap. It's an easy way to go. But if you have uh, a kit that is very soft, you, see, um, you, you don't have a whole lot of hard cornered items in it. Um, a bin liner is going to be your best bet um, because it is very expensive and you can cut it to the size you want. Let's say for the sake of saying so that my uh, interior of my backpack is this wide or excuse me this this tall. So I'm only going to be cutting about a foot off the top of it and um, that right there will be more than enough extra space to be able to close this up once I have the contents in there. And you can always use this for all kinds of other things that you need to wrap up and to be able to use to help keep waterproof. You can use uh, 550, or not 550 cord, but uh, duct tape, uh, something like that to seal it and to be able to access it. But once you have your bag cut to the size that you want you can open it up where it's good and flat it out nice and flat right here on the top and then you can use thousand mile an hour tape we call them that's what we call it when I was in the army but it, it's nothing more than duct tape 
and you can use it on the upper portion of the opening and just pull that all the way across to where it's completely covered. You'll do that to both sides. Then what you have is a bit of rigid material so that once you have your contents in there, you can then roll the top just like you normally do and you can get keep the water out now the censure clincher on this is and the on the ends where the duct tape meets the end of the bag you can poke a small hole in there run a small piece of cordage in there bank line what have you to have those loose ends come out so that way when you roll your bag over you have two ends of cordage that you can tie together loosely to be able to keep this closed and again uh, you're looking at you know several cents uh, worth of material and uh, may maybe a buck you know depending on um, how you buy your bin liners but you have something as if you don't have a lot of items in your kit that's going to damage the bag, you can reuse this multiple times. And I know there's several of you folks out there watching that you have to be very budget conscious. And this would be a much cheaper alternative than those great big old heavy duty waterproof bags. I'll take a look at some smaller bags that you can definitely use inside your packs to sub compartmentalizing things this um, is a snug pack dry bag uh, it's nylon has a roll top buckle closure which I think is, is brilliant as sim simple as it is it really works it has a nice waterproof coating and the seams are uh, taped they're taped I'll show them to you here we go. As you can see, the seam that goes right through here has been taped. So with the coating that's inside and the taped seams, this definitely, for as lightweight of a bag as it is, is remarkably waterproof. And uh, I would have to say it has held up very well over the past uh, six years that I've owned this. This is by far my favorite of my dry bags. They come in multiple sizes, and I have multiple sizes. And this particular size here I use for my uh, sleep kit that has all of my uh, dry base layers, everything I need uh, to be able to sleep warm and comfortable. And I also keep my essential items in here um, and put in my backpack when I'm not carrying my Bushcraft patrol rig or any other type of way like a patrol pack or something like that to have my essential items with me all the time. Now, these are very, very common. They're all over the place. They are different types of material. I believe this one is more of a vinyl type material. This one is silicone. Now, both of these are fairly, fairly large. Um, this one is just slightly larger than the snug pack that I just showed you. But the, the problem with this is it's really thick. And, uh, it's, uh, and when it's cold, it gets really rigid. It, it's, it's loud. And um, again, for something like kayaking or canoeing, boating, something like this I think is, is great. Uh, but for backpacking, uh, not so much. Uh, this one here is silicone based. It's reinforced. It has a, a nice uh, fabric um, that's really heavy duty. It's really tough. It's much more pliable than the vinyl. And even though you can't see what's in it like this one, uh, you can get a pretty good idea because it's more, more of like a, a, a frosted image. You can still see stuff in it, but just not as easily as you can the clear. Uh, this is much more pliable. 
And um, it also has the roll closure. Big fan of the roll closure. And um, it's, it's a great bag. However, this particular one is just a little large for most things that I would use. If I were to have like a, a sleep bag, sleeping bag, sleep system, um, something like that, I'm going to be carrying on the exterior of my pack. Uh, something like this would probably be ideal for that. However, being the color it is, I wouldn't use it. Uh, just because I don't want to stand out when I'm in the woods. Imagine that. But these are larger uh, bags that aren't the huge bags that I showed you originally. And for large uh, items, um, larger like items, you could definitely use something like this as your food bag, which I have used. The nice thing about using something like this as a food bag is once you roll it shut, you have all your food in here. There are D-rings on either side that you can run your 550 cord through, put a weight on the end of your 550 cord, chuck it over a tree branch pretty high up there, pull it down, tie it off, and this bag is suspended. Keeps your food safe from critters and dry in the event of rain. Now these dry bags are by far the least expensive the most easily to acquire and the most versatile of all the wet weather bags that I use. These are the venerable Ziploc baggies and they come in a variety of sizes. Here we have a small square snack bag, a small rectangular snack bag, and I have a standard sandwich bag. And even though I do use the sandwich bags for some items, I will most, most frequently, I will use a freezer bag. And this is the smallest of the freezer bags that I use, and it's a quart size freezer bag. The reason I prefer using the um, freezer bags is the material is much thicker, and the zips are usually much <laughs> more reliable and will seal much better um, and frequently uh, than the uh, sandwich bags and the snack bags. Uh, those will wear out um, pretty quick, both the uh, material that they're made of and the zips will wear out fairly quickly in comparison to the freezer bags. I also use the one gallon size freezer bags and this one is designed to wear it's supposed to be able to stretch a little bit without tearing. And uh, I've not had a chance to use this particular kind, but I can't wait to uh, field test it and to see how that does. And lastly, I actually have a two gallon Ziploc bag. Now, the pull zips, I'm not as big of a fan of as I am the tra traditional pressure zip. I find that these particular zips will fail much more frequently than the pressure zips. However, uh, if you're only using them one at a time or you uh, don't load it all the way up to where you can actually roll the top and maybe put a piece of bungee or a rubber band or something around it to hold it uh, closed, uh, you can even use these when the zips are no longer functional. However, with all of these, I want you, you need to keep in mind that you have to load them loosely. Um, show you a quick example here. If I want to have these gloves and my neck gaiter in here and maybe a little something else, and I'm thinking, well, I'll conserve space and I'll just squish it down and I'll zip it. Well, if you're putting pressure on the upper portion of the zip or you have pressure pushing against the side seams of the bags, you're flirting with disaster because the potential of that failing is much higher than to be able to have things loosely stored in these bags. These two items, uh, the gloves and the neck gaiter, will fit in here perfectly and you can squeeze a little air out if you want to 
make it more packable. These are not airtight, so they very easily will let air back in over a period of time. But if you're subcompartmentalizing items inside your pack, this is a very effective way and a very inexpensive way to be able to subcompartmentalize items in your pack and have them remain uh, free from any moisture that may actually enter your pack. Now the last style of bag I'm going to be showing you are bags and pouches that are specifically designed to subcompartmentalize things. And whether or not it's a sleeping bag, it's your clothes, um, it's your food rations, it's your shaving kit, it doesn't matter. They make sizes and shapes of these types of nylon pouches to accommodate just about anything you could possibly imagine. For the uh, most of them that uh, are produced, that are worth their weight, um, are made of a 500D Kedora nylon. This particular one just happens to be a tough possum gear. Uh, ripper, so you can see that logo. Tough possum gear. Fantastic stuff. Um, good quality zips, uh, good fabric. Now, remember I talked a little bit about waterproof zips. This is not a waterproof zip. If you are subcompartmentalizing in a pack that's already going to be waterproofed or water resistant, then, I mean, you don't have a whole lot of fear from water entering through the zip. Uh, almost all of the 500D Kedora nylon that's uh, manufactured, uh, that these companies use, there is a waxy, you can feel the, the waxy coating. That is a water repellent treatment to repel any moisture that's on the exterior of the pouch. Uh, this one here, this is a, a Mystery Ranch load cell. It does have a waterproof zip and still retains that 500D water resistant coating. I have had these things in the rain um, <laughs> by accident, by accident. And uh, I just simply, I forgot to put it underneath my, my tarp when I went to bed and it rained in the middle of the night. And this had like my cooking stuff in it, my um, stove, uh, cook pot, things like that in it. But I was like, oh man. And the exterior, <laughs> had all kinds of water standing on it from where it was sitting down. It was like pulled up on it, shook it off, opened it up, and the contents were completely dry. Now, it was in the forest, so it wasn't exposed to a driving rain like you would have if you were in the middle of a field. Uh, that probably could have had a lot to do uh, with the water repellency because like I, I've mentioned in my other videos, when a droplet of rain falls directly from the sky and hits the fabric, it does so with a tremendous amount of force and can actually force small molecules of water through even a water repellent material. Now the one thing you need to look, look at when you're looking at these and you really want uh, something to be water repellent or waterproof. You really need to look at the fabrics and the materials they're made of. This is a nylon Kodora like fabric. Uh, it you know has the appearance of it, but when you feel it, it definitely does not have the feel of 500D. And when you look at the interior, there is no waterproof coating. This is a um, I don't know what this is. You can feel a little bit of tack to it, but virtually none. Uh, raw seams here. And um, you got some seam tape, but wow, look at that seam. That's, um, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. That's, that's pretty much raw. J j tapes over, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's very poor sewing on that. Believe it or not, I, I can do a better job than this. I just don't have the time. <laughs> no, so you want to watch out for things if you really want something that's water repellent or waterproof. Now this 
is a compression bag. This is a granite gear compression bag. And this is made of a very thin, lightweight um, nylon. And it is waterproofed coating on the interior. Now, the only thing that I've noticed about this that would, would hamper its, its water uh, proofness are the seams uh, because they are not sealed and the way they doubled over their fabric you have a double layer of fabric in between these as opposed to a single layer like most bags have so that's going to that's going to be a benefit that's going to be much more difficult for water to get in through the stitching holes so I would still uh, feel better if these seals were seamed However, they've never failed me the way that they're sewn. I think that's a pretty innovative way to do it, and I'm certain this is a much less expensive manner to make them much more water repellent, if not waterproof. And, uh, but other than that, uh, the material and the DWR coating that's on this compression bag, I would have no problem accidentally leaving this in the rain overnight and not worry about the items in this one here on the other hand um, yeah whatever's in there it's going to be as wet as it would have been if i would have left it out in the rain now let's go back to the pack let's just say so that your pack is not as waterproof as you'd like it to be or as water repellent as you want it to be this is my fly moddy pack it's one of my uh, newest packs and I'm, I'm deeply enamored with this pack I, I love it. it is so comfortable and I love the streamline quality of it in that there are no exterior pockets on it to speak of um, there's a pouch inside the lid but for the most part I'm very pleased with it it does have a very good um, waterproof coating on the interior I'm not too worried about this and uh, however Let's say I'm going to be hiking Dolly Sods again. And whatever the weatherman says the weather's going to be, that is a 100% guarantee that it is not going to be that weather situation. You will be hiking trails to where you're going to be exposed to direct heavy rains if it starts raining. And if you're hiking through the fog, you are literally going to be saturated with water just you're walking through molecules of water and it's just a matter of time before you have the same effect as you would have if you were to just walk into a stream and walk back out again so you would want to take some type of preventative measures even on a very water resistant pack in order to help make it much more water resistant and one of the ways you can go about doing that is a waterproof pack cover this is a ripstop nylon with a teflon coating again uh used to be all of the uh ripstop type things were like the old usgi ponchos which was a type of a rubber rubber um, coating on the interior super thin but super effective now this is much more of like a teflon uh, it may be silicone based but it's super thin and it's not the same thing as what the old uh, ponchos that were ripstop nylon and waterproof were. Um, these go on super easy because they're elasticized. You just put that over there, pull it down around the bottom and it will completely, and I do mean completely, cover the portion of your pack that is not affecting the use of the frame. Now, that is completely covered, exposing nothing but the frame. Tucks right up underneath, all the way around, and there's a lot of these uh, pack covers that aren't just, you know, elasticized with bungee cord, but they also have a drawstring with a cord lock on them so you can pull it even tighter to lock that in 
and the only amount of moisture that could affect the pack is going to be on the back of it which should receive the least amount of impact from water you may have water that would drip down but it should run down especially like on this system because it's the old Alice frame uh, the waist belt really keeps this frame off your back you have a little bit of uh, your shoulders touching up here but the rest of it's off your back so up here would be about the only place it would collect and it would just roll down so the pack covers are fantastic and I know that you know that's a very common feature now with a lot of packs to have a built-in pack cover that comes with the pack and almost all of the pack manufacturers that I have seen especially for more of like the uh, mainstream backpackers uh, those manufacturers also manufacture uh, pack covers that are specifically designed to fit the packs that they sell. I'm going to share with you a couple of tricks that I have learned through the many, many years of doing this and uh, definitely learning the hard way uh, sometimes is uh, the best way to learn. But I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I do all the time to ensure that I maximize my amount of time in the woods even if it's raining. There are two types of um, kit that I want to be able to access within a matter of seconds. And if I'm hiking along, I'm seeing some clouds rolling in, eh, don't really know if it's rain or not, and then all of a sudden you start hearing it in the distance, you can see it in the distance, you know it's going to start raining. Now, if <laughs> you know, I want to hunker down and, and tough it out, or I want to continue on hiking, you know, those have to be decisions I have to make as far as what type of rain protection that I use. Now, for like the uh, Alice pack or any other pack that has exterior pockets, it's very easy. You can always have your wet weather gear. I got a poncho in this pocket. And a rain jacket in this pocket so I, I, I can choose I can have both of them at the ready now if I want to go ahead and continue hiking chances are I'm probably going to use my poncho because I take my poncho out put my pack back on or if I'm with somebody that makes it a whole lot easier because then my buddy can pop out my poncho I can take it out I pull it over my head and in the front and my buddy can drape it over the backpack. So I'm getting added uh, wet weather protection for my pack. And I can do the same thing for him. If I'm gonna use a rain jacket, that means I gotta take my pack off even if my buddy's there in order to put the rain jacket on. Now, the one thing that's really nice about a poncho, a poncho, if you drape it over your pack, you have airflow. You have airflow coming through. So all of this area here, if it were snapped up, is going to get really hot really quick. And I'm going to not enjoy that um, I experience because I'm going to be soaked. I'm going to be soaked from sweat. And uh, so I should have just went ahead and left the uh, poncho off and just hiked in the rain. If it, the temperature were much more um, hospitable, like in mid-70s on up, you get much below that for a long period of especially a cold rain, that can put you at the threat of hypothermia. Now, the poncho is fantastic. If you have um, any rain jacket that is well made, chances are it's going to have ventilation in it. A zipper under the arm, some type of ventilation. Usually there's a back flap. Uh, which does you no good if you're wearing a backpack but they usually have some form of ventilation to sort of allow some of that perspiration to escape but through my experience uh, the poncho is probably going to be your best bet if you want to continue to hike and hike in a way to where you're not going to die from all that heat being trapped in your wet weather clothing let me show you another trick now 
this is my Mahdi, but I very easily could do the exact same thing with my Alice pack. Now, again, yeah, I'm wearing a poncho. I'm wearing a poncho. But I always want to make sure I have access to my boonie hat. Now, this actually is a Gore-Tex like fabric boonie hat. Now, the thing is, I love about this, look how wide the brim is. Look at that. It's huge. I have a hurricane strap here. Pull that in, and I can even tie a slip knot in there to keep that to where it's not going to blow off. So even in a good storm, I'm good to go. And they're thinking, you, I know you're thinking, it's just like, John, I know you're fashionable. I mean, you, I'm breathtaking right now. I, I know it. I, I'm stunning. Um, actually words are inadequate to express the, the aesthetic pleasure you're probably experiencing by looking at me right now. But you're thinking, yeah, it, it looks good, John. You're, 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 you're styling and profiling, but you're wearing a poncho. How are you going to get a hood over that? Well, that's where the beauty part comes, is the fact that, yeah, I have a poncho, but I can pull that draw cord of the hood around my neck with the hood down on my shoulders and pull it in to where it's cinched around my neck. And I can uh, pull up that uh, cord lock and lock that in place. What that does is allow some of the heat that is normally trapped in a hood. Now think about it, when you're wearing a hood, there's like three-fourths of your noggins trapped in a waterproof container. It's going to get hot really quick. And heat loss through your noggin is the, the best way for your body to cool itself. So you, you don't want to have that thing on there unless you're like standing around. You're not doing anything. You're not exerting yourself. And you're still going a little hot. So what this does is it allows the, the rain to drip down on areas that's not around the neck. Drips all the way around and allows some of that heat to escape. There's a couple little vent ports up here where it vents a little bit, but still a little bit's better than none. And another nice thing about it, when I'm out in the woods, I like to be able to see. I rely on my peripheral vision a lot. And when you have that wet hood on, I don't care how you finagle a poncho hood. It never fits the way, you know, like a really well-made Gore-Tex hood does to where you can pull that little scent strap in the back and it just like fits perfect around it. No, 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 not a poncho. A poncho, eh, it's horrible. It's like wearing a plastic bag on your head. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. So, you know, I get better vision with this and I can hear stuff. I can hear stuff. When I have that poncho around my ears, it blocks my hearing, and all I'm hearing is the rain bouncing off of that poncho. Now, you're probably saying, well, John, you, you, you got basically a tin roof going around your head. That's going to make some noise. Yes, it does. It does make some noise. But I prefer this type of noise over to the muffled noise that I get where I wear a poncho. So whether you're going to go with a rain jacket or you're going to go with a poncho, I would recommend getting a decent boonie. I don't care if it's like a, 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 a even your standard boonie, because even if it gets soaked through, it's still going to be dripping off the edges. You can also DWR treat it. And um, that way, you know, you're going to have the water repellency or the waterproofing and it's going to do exactly what this does. Again, a wider brim will usually work a little bit better for this technique. But even a standard brim uh, boonie, if you have it pulled in pretty, pretty decent and you have all that ventilation, you're going to be as cool as you possibly can be, as dry as you possibly can be. You're going to have peripheral vision. You're going to be able to hear better. All of which I think are pros and I don't see any cons in this that would prevent me from continuing to do this technique. Now in addition 
to having my wet weather gear immediate access literally you want to be able to deploy that within seconds you also want to have access to your tarp in seconds so as you can see my tarp is right here I actually had my boonie wrapped around it and I know I know you're all sad because it took the boonie off hey you need to calm down you need to calm down okay it's just a hat I know I'm wearing it but still just a hat but I had my boonie wrapped around it and um, if I were to be using my Mahdi I would have had my poncho folded not in the pouch like I had it here over top of my tarp now the reason I want my tarp at the ready numerous reasons let's just say for the sake of saying so I'm gonna to tough it out got my poncho on got my, my boonie on I'm just gonna hike to camp and you know when I get there I don't have to worry about if it's raining or not to set up my camp because if I have my tarp I can immediately put my tarp up and then set the rest of my camp up underneath of it out of the rain now there's there's a caveat to this because you can't have just your tarp you can't have just your tarp you have to pre-rig your tarp with your ridge line prusiks attached and any anything that you normally do with your ridge line it needs to already be on here and you also need to have at least four corners of your tarp with cordage and tensioners on it ready to stake out and deploy you also need to have your tent stakes inside your tarp now let's just say that you prefer using a tensioning knot well fine go ahead set it up leave those tensioning knots in position loosen them up a little bit so you can pull your tent stakes out and then you can slide them up all the way you want so that way it's a perfect double loop and make sure it's good and tight it's still there if you have like i have uh, commercial tensioners on mine i just i just leave them in position and what i will do is i will fold my cordage bring it all the way out fold it in half pull it out fold it in half pull it out fold it in half until I have just enough of that cordage left to where I can do an overhand knot, loose overhand knot. Because that way, it's, it's all compartmentalized. It's all not going to get tangled. Individually, these cordages, these cords, these guy lines can be deployed. And they do it within seconds. So some of you, I mean, you might see the benefit in doing this even in dry weather because, you know, you don't have to spend the time tying your guy lines onto the grommets or onto the webbing in the corners, pull them out because they're already there. But for wet weather, this is an absolute must. And um, so I have all the cordage in here. None of it's tangled. It's ready to go. I have my uh, Prusix knots already on the, the webbing. So I stretch out my tarp, it's, it's ready to go. So that's if you're just gonna be going to camp. You have a, a, the beauty of being able to just stand underneath your tarp, you know, take your poncho off, you know, uh, chill out for a few minutes before you actually start setting up your camp, whether or not you're uh, doing a, a, a tent camp underneath of it, a bivy, uh, a hammock, you know, it doesn't matter. You have a dry place to set it up. And the other thing, um, let's say you and a couple of your friends are headed out and you know that we're, we're expecting sporadic rain showers. Now well, we see one, some, one coming. So I very easily could take my tarp out, deploy it and set it up. And when the rain hits, we can stand underneath there. It can be completely out of the rain, comfortable, dry. And when that rain shower passes through I just take the tarp down fold it back up put it right back in my pack and keep on trucking now those two things there 
have really come in handy. And um, when you're in complete control of being able to set your pace, to be able to set up camp where and when you want to, not in designated camping areas, not on designated trails, all of these other things you have to contend with, you have the freedom to camp the way you choose to camp. These two things make, make it easy. I mean, you, you can set up camp early. Maybe put a little more distance in the next, next day. It's all up to you. But you can do it now and be as dry as you possibly can be while it's raining. Now, when you get back to camp and it's finally stopped raining and you're soaked, you have all these wet clothes on. You want to, especially if you're not expecting any more rain, you're going to want to dry those clothes. So you're always going to want to have some type of cordage available so that you can make a clothesline close to your campfire. The other thing you can do is you can use a tripod, make a tripod out of, out of saplings, whatever. And you can use these, there's multiple points on these to where you can hang clothing. You can drape the clothing around the sides and you can position that and maneuver those around the fire, rotate those around like a rotisserie anywhere you need to around the fire to facilitate the drying. If you're really brave and you know what you're doing, you can maintain a small fire in the middle of your tripod if you have a very tall tripod and it will draw dry it from the inside out so it, whether you're going to use a tripod to dry your clothes with or the traditional clothesline to dry your clothes with you're definitely going to want to dry those clothes let's just say for the sake of saying so you get back to camp you set your tarp up exactly the way i described earlier your camp's all set up, but it's pouring down rain. You have no hope of being able to make a fire, to dry your clothes out. Now, I always will take what I call my sleep kit with me. I have dry socks in here. I have change of unders. It's very important. Very important to have extra unders. And I have a super lightweight uh, summer weight uh, top and bottom merino wool. I also have a pair of uh, merino wool uh, glove liners and a sleep cap just in case I'm out when it's supposed to be particular temperature level and it drops below that and the insulation I have to sleep in doesn't facilitate <laughs> the, the warmth that I need. I have a little extra layer I can always put on. Now I always have this with me and uh, so it's pouring down rain. It ain't stopping. Now, I'm not going to go to bed soaking wet. I'm not going to be wearing those soaking wet clothes. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to strip all those wet clothes off. And I'm going to try to some way, shape, or form hang those underneath my, my, my tarp to where they're not going to be laying in the mud. They're just, they're just laying loose. And then I'm going to take my microfiber towel and I'm going to dry my body off as much as I possibly can. Since I mostly hammock camp, I'll dry my entire body to the point to where, you know, I'm down on my feet. I'll sit in my hammock and then I'll dry my feet. Then what I will do is I'll put my dry clothes on and uh, wear those, you know, if, if need be. If it's really warm outside, I'm by myself, I'm going al natural until I have to put the clothes on. Now, when I wake up the next morning, I'm not going to be putting wet clothes over top of dry clothes, especially if I, have, I still have a threat of rain. I'm going to put my wet clothes back on and wear those out <laughs> to my next camp or wear those out to where I'm going to get to my vehicle. Now, that's not a pleasant thing. It's definitely not a pleasant thing to wear or put on wet clothes early in the morning, especially when they're cold, but that's what you got to do. And um, especially if it's raining, because they're already wet. 
you don't want to get your dry stuff uh, wet. Now, if you're going to a second camp, the necessity of having dry clothes, again, is going to be very important because you got to go through the same, uh, same system. Like if you're, if you're going to be there for a while and it's still raining, you can put your dry clothes on, hang out underneath your tarp, be comfortable. But you don't wear your dry clothes out in the rain, out in the moisture when you already have wet clothes. You put your wet clothes back on. Now, if you take extra clothes with you out in the wilderness, then you're set. I mean, you always have dry stuff, proper clothes to change into. I rarely take additional real clothing. Uh, socks, underwear, t-shirt, something like that is usually all I take out extra with me. But you, you're, you're completely soaked. You set up camp. You have a good dry night's sleep because you have your sleep clothes. And it stopped raining and you have dry clothes to put on okay you know regular regular clothes you brought extra so you can hike back out you have all of these wet clothes to deal with and by this point I guarantee you those clothes aren't just going to be wet they're going to be filthy as well so as opposed to having all of that stuff shoved in your pack getting everything dirty everything muddy everything wet even though you should be compartmentalizing everything in waterproof bags, you're going to want to separate that. So taking a regular, I think this is a 30-gallon uh, trash bag, and it's got a drawstring on it. It's one of those uh, flex force uh, bags that can stretch without uh, puncturing. Shove all that stuff in here, then put it in your pack. And I guarantee you, when you get back home and you go to start separating out your kit and putting it away, you're going to have a whole lot less uh, items that you're going to need to clean up uh, because you used your noodle and you took a trash bag to put those wet, dirty clothes in. Yeah, the hat's back. Now, let's just say for the sake of saying so, that for whatever reason, you have to get in your pack and it's just pouring down rain absolutely pouring down rain let's just say for the sake of saying so you pooped your pants and you got to get, got to get some clean unders okay because you don't want the monkey butt so what you're going to do is this of course take the hat off tuck that between my legs pull the hood loose Drape your head under it, drape the pack under it, that way you are able to access your pack, get what you need, close your pack back up, Put your boonie back on. Sits that draw cord, cord lock it. And now you have whatever it is that you had to have from your backpack in a pouring down rain without getting anything in your pack wet. Well, folks, it's time to wrap things up. Hopefully some of the things I shared with you today, whether or not it was pieces of kit, or some of the tricks and tips I may have uh, presented in this video, you can find useful and perhaps want to add that to your bushcrafting bag of tricks. If by any chance you do the same types of things I do and experience successes with those, or if you have tricks of your own that you think would help out our fellow bushcrafting wild camping community, please share those in the comments below. As always, folks, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you next time.